Welcome to another installment of Donning the Armor. This morning we will begin in Leviticus chapter 11, verse 1. Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying to them, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, These are the animals which you may eat among all the animals that are on the earth. Among the animals, whatever divides the hoof, having cloven hooves and chewing the cud that you may eat. So now we're going to get into dietary restrictions. What is considered clean and unclean and some of which doesn't make a lot of sense to me as a person, but this is what the Lord has commanded his people. As I was saying a few episodes ago, he did not choose to make his children walk a smooth path. It was a rocky one, one that would separate them from all the people around them that would make them be absolutely special and wholly set apart for him. Not an easy path, but one that would keep them safe for generations and generations yet to come. These rules on cleanliness would see Jewish people being affected by the bubonic plague at a far less rate than everybody else around them. Christians around them were dying left and right, and the smaller numbers of Jews were not catching the plague as much. That would then cause um, Christians, especially the Roman denomination, which was in political power at the time, to persecute them for these things because they considered it to be witchcraft is the reason. They are doing these horrible other things, those evil people who killed Jesus because, you know, some of these medieval denominations uh, were pretty ruthless under the leadership they were under by very flawed people, regardless of how perfect the Pope is supposed to be when he speaks of things of, of religion and Christianity. He is far from it because he's a man. But these things would keep them safe. These dietary rules, these rules of cleanliness, the Jews would continue to follow them, and Orthodox Jews continue to follow them to this day. And because of that, they have healthier outcomes in lots of instances. But continuing in verse 4, Nevertheless, these you shall not eat among those that chew the cud or those that have cloven hooves. The camel, because it chews the cud but does not have cloven hooves, it is unclean to you. The rox hyrax, because it chews the cud but does not have cloven hooves. It is unclean to you. The hare, because it chews the cud, but does not have cloven hoods. It is unclean to you. Now, this is one, this verse 6, that people for the longest time would use to point to why the Bible is false. And why the Bible never lines up to science and science. It, they know nothing about it. The hyrax is also considered a coney. Um, that the, the hare, rabbits, they don't chew the cud. They don't chew the gut seat. See, God doesn't know what he's talking about. For centuries, they would say this. Until, you know, about 50, 80 years ago. Sometime in the mid-1900s. They realized that hares, rabbits, conies, they do this thing called refection. And what it is, is when they eat these, they eat the grass because they're herbivores. They eat the grass. They eat all of this stuff, this greenery. Sometimes it goes undigested and they poop it out undigested. So therefore it's not coming out as poop. It's coming out as actual grass. And then the hare turns around and will re-eat that food because they view it as food, even though it just came out their butt. So, in that way, no, they do not chew the cud as a cow would chew the cud, where they continue to chew and then vomit it back up into their mouth and then chew it down and then vomit it back up through their multiple stomachs. But they do this, which is also similar. And because of that, this animal is unclean to you. And the swine, though it divides the hoof, having cloven hooves, yet does not chew the cud, 
it is unclean to you. Their flesh you shall not eat, and their carcasses you shall not touch. They are unclean to you. It's just a shame, because swine are delicious. But they are also very filthy animals. They are very dirty and very dangerous. Um, there's, also, there's always the reason why that joke is if somebody owns a pig farm, you can get rid of a body pretty easily, because they will eat anything. You throw a body in there, they'll eat it. They're vegetarians normally, but pigs will eat anything they can get their mouths on. Anything at all. And because of that, they are unclean for the Jewish people. Because it helps limit the amount of diseases that would get into their own system. Now, this would be a rule that the two and a half tribes that stay on the one side of the Jordan, not entering into the promised land, they would stay behind and they would start worshiping the Lord very, very imperfectly is being generous. But they would keep pigs. We see that when Jesus goes and sends the demons into the pigs and the pigs run off the cliff. They had pigs even though they were Jews because their idea of getting around this was that they would keep their pigs on an elevated platform, therefore out of the mud, therefore they're clean, even though that's not what God said at all, and they're still unclean to them. Thankfully, the Lord sent the message to Peter saying, they're now clean, and you will, it may not call unclean what I call clean. I like that ruling. These you may eat of all that are in the water, whatever in the water has fins and scales, whether in the seas or in the rivers, that you may eat. But in all the seas and in the rivers that do not have fins and scales, all that move in the water or any living thing which is in the water, they are an abomination to you. They are to be vomitous. Shrimp, crab, lobster, they are to be vomitous to you. They do not have fins and scales. Lobsters are basically cockroaches of the sea. Let that fester in your brain for a minute. They shall be an abomination to you. You shall not eat their flesh, but you shall regard their carcasses as an abomination. Whatever in the water does not have fins or scales, that shall be an abomination to you. Fish only. No squid, no crab, no lobster, no shrimp, nothing like that. Fish only. Everything else is an abomination. The mariners up in New England hit hardest. And these you shall regard as an abomination among the birds. They shall not be eaten. They are an abomination. The eagle, the vulture, the buzzard, the kite and the falcon after its kind. A lot of these are because of the way with which they eat dead animals. Buzzards, vultures, they're carrion beasts. They eat, they eat dead animals, so they are unclean. I mean, no one would really think to go eat a buzzard. It's not something you do. Eagle, more, they eat living things. So the children of Israel, if you notice, lots of things they're allowed to eat are things that eat the vegetation, not eat flesh, not eat blood. The blood is sacred to God because blood is where the life is. So the eagle would be in that category, falcon in that category. Every raven after its kind. People will point this out and say, well, what about Elijah? Elijah, when he was hiding from the drought, got ravens sent to him every day, bringing him food. The ravens brought him the food. He did not eat the raven. The ravens were the carrier birds of God. He didn't actually eat the ravens. He simply ate the food they delivered. The ostrich, the short-eared owl, the seagull, anybody who knows seagulls knows you don't want to be touching one of those things, and the hawk after its kind, the little owl, the fisher owl, the screech owl, the, the white owl, the jackdaw, the carrion vulture, the stork, the heron after its kind, the wupo, and the bat. And in 2024, post-COVID, I pray everyone has learned to stay away from the bats. Plus, they're adorable. Bats are just tiny flying mice. They're awesome. But as you can see, most of these birds that they're listing are ones that eat flesh. Sometimes dead flesh, sometimes living flesh, but they eat flesh. 
And so God is saying, these are unclean. You do not touch these birds. All flying insects that creep on all fours shall be an abomination to you. Yet these you may eat of every flying insect that creeps on all fours, those which have jointed legs above their feet on with, with which to hop, to leap on the earth. They also do hop. Now, the King James just says that have legs above their feet. That doesn't add the jointed. The New King James and other translations add the jointed. So, you can see certain things, don't eat them. Other things, you, you can eat those. John the Baptist, you can tell. Elijah, certain things, you kind of already know what they ate. These you may eat, the locust after its kind, the destroying locust after its kind, the cricket after its kind, and the grasshopper after its kind. But all other flying insects which have four feet shall be an abomination to you. So you can eat locusts, you can eat crickets, you can eat grasshoppers. And in the Middle East, they still sell these things on street corners. They still eat dried locusts. They still eat grasshoppers and crickets. I'm not eating the bugs. But... These are things that God has said are clean. Other things, spiders don't eat venom. Um, ants probably won't be able to get enough to fill, do anything for you anyway. But you're not to eat these other creatures. They are not clean. These are clean per the dictates of the Lord. By these you shall become unclean. Whoever touches the carcass of any of them shall be unclean until evening. Whoever carries part of the carcass of any of them shall wash his clothes and be unclean until evening. The carcass of any animal which divides the foot but is not cloven hooved or does not chew the cud is unclean to you. Everyone who touches it shall be unclean. So these are ways that a person themselves can be unclean. We go over the unclean food. Now it's the people. How do you become unclean? And you can become unclean by touching a dead body. A dead body of a person, as we'll learn, or a dead body of an animal. Now, if one of your flock dies, you obviously need to take care of that. You need to touch it. And if you do, it's not that you're sinful. It's not that any of that. It's just that you now, because you touched a dead body and are now being it, um, you are being subjected to the germs because you are being subjected to anything that may have been on that, any disease that may have killed the animal. You're now touching something. You are making yourself unclean to be around other people. So if that happens, you need to go wash your clothes. You need to go wash yourself. And then you will be unclean until evening. And as Jews kept their days from evening to evening, not morning to morning, basically saying you will be unclean for the remainder of the day. And then you will be clean when the new day begins. Basically also helps in the idea that by counting from evening to evening, I didn't actually consider this when I was thinking out about before until right the second, but this allows somebody to return home to go sleep in their house at night. Because if you're, if you touch something at noon and you're unclean until the next day, you count morning to morning, you're sleeping outside in the wilderness. This evening, the evening allows you to go back home, go sleep in your home, and you are now clean. And it's not a moral uncleanliness as in sin. It's just a ritual uncleanliness and a hygienic uncleanliness that you now need to clean. The carcass of any animal that divides the foot but not cloven-footed or does not chew the cud is unclean to you. Everyone who touches it shall be unclean. So basically, don't touch any any animal that is to be unclean. That makes you also unclean, and you need to do what needs to be done. And whatever goes on its paws among all kinds of animals that go on all fours, those are unclean to you. Whoever touches any such carcass shall be unclean until evening. So, goes on its paws. Don't eat dog. Don't eat cat. Those are unclean. Also, if you have to touch... a a lion, you're unclean. If you have to touch these things, you know, you, you're a shepherd, you kill a lion to protect your flock, a wolf, uh, you now need to remove the body. That makes you unclean. You are not to touch these things. 
Whoever carries any such carcass shall wash his clothes and be unclean until evening. It is unclean to you. Mainly, it is meant for cleanliness. You are to be clean, and in these times, most people didn't have showers. They weren't going to go clean themselves three times a day. You know, they had water. They didn't have antibacterial soap. So, in a lot of ways, a lot of these cultures were pretty dirty. And because of that, the Jewish people were to be set apart from that uncleanliness and to be clean people, to keep themselves healthy in a culture, in the cultures, I should say, that they're going to be around who are going to be unclean people and do pretty nasty things. These shall also be unclean to you among the creeping things that creep on the earth, the mole, the mouse, and the large lizard after its kind, the gecko, the monitor lizard, the sand reptile, the sand lizard, and the chameleon. These are unclean to you among all that creep. Whoever touches them when they are dead shall be unclean until evening. So this is, this is a part of don't touch these things, don't touch their dead bodies. Also, don't eat. That is going to continue to be a thing. A, a, task that, you know, don't put that in your mouth kind of thing. And it's because children of Israel, fledgling nation, young, think about dealing with children. You constantly have to tell them, do not touch that. Do not touch that. I once years ago saw kids, young, poking a dead squirrel with a stick. <laughs> I mean, as an adult, you're just going, don't, don't, don't do that. But a kid, you don't understand. So God, as the grown up in the situation, telling his children, don't, don't touch that. That's going to make you unclean. Now you need to go clean yourself until evening. Anything on which any of them falls when they are dead shall be unclean. Whether it is any item of wood or clothing or skin or sack, whatever item it is, in any in which any work is done, it must be put in water, and it shall be unclean until evening. Then it shall be clean. So if any of these things, because most of these things are small things that would infest a house or a tent, a mouse, a gecko, you know, you could have a, a, a chameleon just die and fall in your bowl from the ceiling. Now that bowl is dirty. It needs to be cleaned must be put in water until evening and cleaned out, and then it will be clean when evening comes. Any earthen vessel in which any of them falls, you shall break, and whatever is in it shall be unclean. So earthen vessels were normally kept, clay va vases, things like that, were kept for um, storing things, more or less than a wooden bowl. He's saying that stuff you can just wash. But... These earthen vessels would normally keep water in them. They would keep uh, flour in them. You would keep different spices in them. If it goes into any of that, then you just need to get rid of whatever's in it and destroy the vessel altogether. Because you don't want to have anything lingering in something that you're going to store things in. Uh, one of the reasons they would get um, cholera, I believe in the old west lots of times they would have stores of water you get some rats in the water the rats would die in the water they would disease the water and the people wouldn't know because you couldn't see inside the tank unless you broke it open and people would start falling sick well this is the same idea what he's trying to keep his own people from this cleanliness seems it seems excessive. It seems weird to have to write all this stuff down. But it is to keep his own people safe in ways that they did not think for themselves, in ways that we often don't consider. We just know because we've been raised with it. These people, these children of Israel, weren't raised with it, so they're being taught for the first time as adults. In such a vessel, any edible food upon which water falls becomes unclean and any drink that may be drunk from it becomes unclean so basically anything that's edible if it also becomes wet um that is to be tossed away because of mold and mildew 
you know, you, you, you put edible food and you pour water in it and you leave it to sit, it's going to grow mold. It's going to go bad. So if that happens, you need to throw it away. And everything on which a part of any such carcass falls shall be unclean. Whether it is an oven or a cooking stove, it shall be broken down, for they are unclean, and shall be unclean to you. Nevertheless, a spring or a cistern, in which there is plenty of water, it shall be clean. But whatever touches any such carcass becomes unclean. So if you find something in a large pool of water, a spring, a cistern with large amounts of water, a spring because that's moving water, so if there's a dead thing in it, you can remove it and the clean water will be clean. Cistern, that one is, is in my mind, a, a little bit different because that's a well, but oftentimes it has to do um, with the way that the water's kept underground that if you pull the thing out, the water still tends to be clean from the minerals in the cistern itself. And if a part of any such carcass falls on any planting seed which is to be sown, it remains clean. So if it just falls on a planting seed, the seed is still clean because you're not going to damage the seed. The seed's going to go into the ground. It's going to sprout up. The seed itself basically just dies and is destroyed and a plant comes out of it in its place. So the carcass is not going to make that unclean. But if water is put on a seed, and if a part of su any such carcass falls on it, it becomes unclean to you. Because water would cause the seed to begin to germinate, and then something unclean touches it, it affects the plant portion of it now, which makes the whole plant unclean. And if any animal which you may eat dies, he who touches its carcass shall be unclean until evening. He who eats of its carcass shall wash his clothes and be unclean until evening. He also who carries its carcass shall wash his clothes and be unclean until evening. So if it's a clean animal and you still touch the carcass, you're now unclean. You now need to go do the ritual washing and everything as needed. And every creeping thing that creeps on the earth shall be an abomination. It shall not be eaten. Whatever crawls on its belly, whatever goes on all fours, or whatever has many feet, among all creeping things that creep on the earth, these you shall not eat, for they are an abomination. You, are not, you shall not make yourselves abominable with any creeping thing that creeps, nor shall you make yourselves unclean with them, lest you be defiled by them. For I am the Lord your God. You shall therefore consecrate yourselves, and you shall be holy, for I am holy. Nevertheless, you shall ne never... No, I'm sorry. For I am holy, neither shall you defile yourselves with any creeping thing that creeps on the earth. For I am the Lord who brings you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. You shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. You are my children. I am holy. You are to be holy. You are to be holy because I am your father. You are to follow me and do as I do. I told you you are to be holy. You are to be holy in my image as you are created. I'm the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. I am your God. I am going to be your leader. I am going to show you something better. Therefore, you are holy because I am holy. Don't do these things that I told you not to do because I am keeping you separated as I am separate. This is the law of the animals and the birds and every living creature that moves in the waters and of every creature that creeps on the earth to distinguish between the unclean and the clean and between the animal that may be eaten and the animal that may not be eaten. So Moses is just pointing out, this is the law of the animals and the birds and the living creatures. This is the law is regard to uncleanliness and cleanliness. These are the things you do and the things you don't do when it comes to these dietary restrictions and your personal uncleanliness. All right, moving on to chapter 12. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the children of Israel saying, if a woman has conceived and born a male child, then she shall be unclean seven days as in the days of her customary impurity, she shall be unclean. And on the eighth day, the flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised. She shall con then continue in the blood of her purification 33 days. 
She shall not touch any hallowed thing nor come into the sanctuary until the days of her purification are fulfilled. So we know eight days, boy is circumcised. These are the amount of days that a woman is to be kept separate because her body needs to recover. Blood will continue to come out. For 33 days, she is to be seen as ceremonially unclean, ritually unclean in ways of worship, not in ways of moral standing. No sin here, just like the other uncleanliness issues. There's no sin in this. There's no moral judgment because having children, being married before the Lord is a good thing. It's a command of his, but it is also understood that when these things happen, you are unclean for worship at the tabernacle and with the congregation. In a way, it's also a symbol of the impurity that we are born into. Remember, people are body, soul, and spirit. That is the way Adam was created. When he chose to sin, he killed the spirit. And we as his descendants are born with a dead spirit. We are soul and body only. And it is only until we are reborn in him through justification that we have our, our spirit reborn inside of us and become a trinity unto ourselves again. Not a holy trinity like, you know, God, but a trinity of working together, a body, a shell, a soul, our consciousness, and a spirit that belongs to him. But if she bears a female child, then she shall be unclean two weeks as is as in her customary impurity, what she would normally be when she has her period. And she shall continue in the blood of her purification 66 days. When the days of her purification are fulfilled, whether for a son or a daughter, shall, she shall bring to a priest a lamb of the first year as a burnt offering and a young pigeon or turtle dove as a sin offering to the door of the tabernacle of meeting. So if she has a daughter, she's to be unclean pretty much twice as long. Why? Don't know. But that is the pre prescription of the Lord. But then we get to chapter uh, verse six and we see something interesting that we could refer to in the future when it comes to Christ. Now, when her days of her purification are fulfilled, she then brings the son or daughter and brings up a burnt offering, a lamb of the first year is a burnt offering and a young pigeon or turtle dove is a sin offering as a sign of original sin for towards the Lord. Then he shall offer it before the Lord and make atonement for her, and she shall be clean from the flow of her blood. This is the new law for her who was born a male or a female. And if she is not able to bring a lamb, then she may bring two turtle doves or two young pigeons. One is a burnt offering and the other is a sin offering. So the priest shall make atonement for her and she will be clean. Now this goes to when... Jesus is being brought to the sanctuary, to the temple in Jerusalem after he's being, after he was born. Joseph and Mary bring two turtle doves. They don't bring a lamb because they could not afford the lamb. See, it, there's a theory of Christianity that goes that Mary was a perpetual virgin forever, that Joseph was an old man who took her in, who was wealthy and had all these other children. And those are the brothers and sisters of Jesus. They didn't come from Mary. They came from Joseph, who's old and married and is wealthy and is able to care for this young woman who he calls a wife. Only if that was the case, then Mary and Joseph sin when they bring Jesus to the temple because they only offer up two turtle doves when they had the wealth to offer up a lamb. See, the truth is Mary and Joseph were a young couple who are basically stigmatized in their view of the people around them because she, for all outside appearances, is having a baby out of wedlock. They're poor. He's a carpenter. 
They don't have a lot of money. And here you have two young people making a life for themselves, giving forth the offering that they have to give. The Lord wasn't born into a rich family to be wealthy. He was born into a family that was humble, to be humbled, to be in a position of humility. Because that would be, that would show that the signs that he is bringing forth are that much greater. Coming from a family that wasn't lauded, that wasn't rich, wasn't Daniel of the line of David with the line of kings. This is Jesus, born lowly, poor, born with brothers and sisters. And even a mother, we're told at times, that did not understand him, that thought he was out of his mind at times, who didn't believe in his, his being the Messiah until after his resurrection. His brothers and sisters didn't believe he was who he said he was. He was misunderstood in his own family. That is the Jesus that the Bible records. Not the Jesus that has been passed down through certain traditions and has been changed to fit their denominational truth, their denominational view and perception of things. The truth is the word of God, his revealed word to us. We don't all get to have our own truths. There is one. And that one shows this, that Jesus was humble. Joseph and Mary were humble. Blessed beyond comprehension in the task and responsibility they were given. But humble of means. So when we look forth at our lives and we see we live a humble life. We don't have to sit back and think, well, I'm not as rich and successful as Daniel and David and Solomon and Joshua. No, all we are called to be is humble, to walk out in faith, his walk, the walk he did in humility when he lowered himself intentionally to be slightly below the angels with us that he limited his power on earth to show what we need to be to be righteous before god jesus christ is always the beacon always the light we need to look to he is god he is lord he is king he is our shining example. The, the scriptures show him everywhere if we look. We can see nuggets of truth about him everywhere, even through the Old Testament. Because he is the word of God. The word become flesh. The father, the hunt, the, the father, the son, and the Holy Spirit. One God, three manifestations of it, not three modes, three manifestations in one complete form. There is salvation only through him. And the Lord is baby stepping his people step by step to that revealed truth. That we in our day and age have the ability to accept or deny. It is up to us. I pray that if you're watching this, you accept and head down that narrow path. That narrow path that ends in the presence of the Lord. But anyway, that is where we will end it for today. I hope this was fruitful for you. I hope to see you again next time, but until then, be blessed.